the opportunity for us to speak to you on really giving an overview of our work portfolio and also an important update. And the timing couldn't be more perfect, obviously, as the state itself is dealing with some of the, the uh, changes in uh, the water conditions throughout and dealing with a persistent drought and certainly discussions that were even brought up yesterday in the governor state, the state. So uh, it's on the minds of many Arizona communities. It seems like now time for us to discuss uh, with you where we stand with our portfolio, some of the major issues that are, that are coming up. So we're lucky enough to have Tammy Shreve, our Water Resources Director, uh, along with Dave Burke, David Burks, our Deputy Water Services Director, and Kate Powers, our Planning and Operations Manager, uh, who will provide a, you an overview for this. But I'll pass it over to Mr. Stark. Thank you, Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I've got a little bit of a script here. As we go through the presentation tonight, you'll find out that it's very complicated when you talk about water and various partners that are involved. So trying to maintain a little focus here, not ramble too much. But we think we've got a very good presentation for you, as Mr. Tyne said, uh, talking about what our water portfolio is, um, some of the dynamic that's currently occurring, and, and how we more or less positioned ourselves as a city to counter as much of that as possible. Um, Mayor and Council, as you know, the Peoria and the entire Southwest portion of the United States has been in a prolonged period of drought, about 20 years or so. Um, at the same time, the city in, in this region, the Southwest region, have experienced phenomenal rates of growth and have used available sources of water very wisely and prudently to our residents, visitors, and for economic development purposes. This is the direct result of good, proper planning and good, proper growth, um, good policy in general. We last updated you in May of 2017, it was a couple of years ago, and what we did is we discussed the portfolio, the water portfolio, but we also talk, talked about a revision to the drought contingency plan for the city of Peoria. Since then, the federal government has determined that one of our primary sources of water, the Colorado River, no longer has the flow rate to provide total water needs for our region, Peoria included. And when I speak of our region, kind of talk about uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, California, and even internationally, uh, Mexico, and then there's a lot of smaller uh, water providers within that context. Um, as you can imagine, the, the flow, its use, the allocation, that been established through years of not only negotiation amongst all those different partners at different levels, but also through court decisions and various water policies enacted by the federal, states, and even locally. On the cumulative impact of these issues, the existing drought that we're in, the reduced amount of Colorado River water in general, have prompted the federal government to issue a challenge to Arizona to revise its own drought management plan. And we're going to obviously talk to you a little bit. Um, after months of discussions by entities such as the Central Arizona Project, the Department of Water Resources, um, various Native American tribes in, in the Arizona area, water districts, member cities of the Arizona Municipal Water Association, Mayor Carla is a, a very active member of that, um, a revised drought plan is now kind of making its way through the Department of Water Resources and the, and the uh, Central Arizona Project. The next stopping off point is the state legislature. And we have been challenged by the federal government uh, by January 31st of this year, a few weeks down the road, to have enacted a drought management plan. Um, the purpose of the item this evening is to talk to you, as I mentioned, about the water portfolio, its diversity, how our planning efforts and good decisions of this and previous councils have resulted in sound local water policy and the pride and assurance to you and the community that we will continue to have sufficient water to meet our needs in the foreseeable future. As Jeff mentioned, taking the lead of Tammy Tree, our acting water services director. Um, we also have uh, uh, David Burks, our acting deputy director, who's right here. And then we have Kate Powers, who's our planning and operations manager. And, and Kate's going to take the lion's share conversation. And before we begin, just a, a real quick acknowledgement. Um, a lot of this, uh, where we're at, the good planning, uh, is the result of a lot of efforts from, from employees that aren't here tonight. One of them in particular, Alan Delaney, um, has been at the forefront of, of water issues on the earth we have regionally and nationally. And we'd also like to thank um, Thomas Atkins, our intergovernmental um, director. Um, 
he plays a very important role and will continue to play a very, very strategic role in, in the coming weeks and months as drought contingency plan unfolds. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Tammy. We're going to try our best to avoid acronyms and technical terms, but we may stumble a little bit, so apologies in advance. And with that, Tammy, the, it's all yours. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you to be here today to discuss our Peoria's water resource portfolio. Water is a basic element to sustaining life. We need water to help communities, to support economic competitiveness, and for quality of life. And in the Arab the desert, which is where we live, it is a precious resource, not to be wasted or taken for granted. And as Eric mentioned, our past and present council and executive leaders have understood the importance of water to our community. And it's through decades of planning, foresight, and action that they took that we have we are in a very good position of having a sound diverse water resource portfolio and infrastructure. Water seems like a really simple topic, right? You turn on your faucet, and quality, great tasty Peoria water comes out. But it's really a complicated topic when you talk about the water where it begins and how it gets to the faucet. And so as we go through our presentation today, talking about our portfolio, talking about the impacts of the prolonged drought, we want to encourage you to ask questions. It will, might be technical, but it won't be dull. It'll really, it's a very exciting presentation, Lauren. It's exciting business. But feel free to interrupt and, and, to, and to ask questions. We want to make sure we're, we're relaying our message correctly. Our presentation is going to provide just a brief overview of the Water Services Department, Dave is going to highlight the treatment facilities and well, which is part of our portfolio. Kate will then present a detailed description of our water resources and our shared water supply. And then go into a discussion about the drought management plan and how that may affect Peoria. And finally, but most importantly, we want to get your thoughts and opinions on the topics that we present today. The Water Services Department was created about seven months ago with the Division of the Public Works Utility Department. The utilities portion is now the Water Services Department and the Public Works is a standalone department. We have 96 full-time employees and an operation budget of approximately $38 million. This organizational chart is laid out by function. They are deputy handles the majority of the department with all the water services. That would be all the plants, all the water and reclamation facilities, the environmental compliance programs, and all the operation activities. Kate is a manager of the planning and operations, handling all the CIP coordination, water planning and policy, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today, and all the infrastructure communication network, or SCADA. And Lisa Strato oversees all the sustainability and conservation efforts. <coughs> Part of our portfolio includes our infrastructure. Nate's going to provide an overview of the infrastructure that we have. Thank you, Mr. East, Mayor and Council. Uh, take a minute to talk about our water treatment facilities. Um, I just have an easy part of this presentation. Mr. Powers over there has the difficult and complicated portion. Uh, Quintero, we'll start with Quintero. It's a small microfiltration plant located in the far northwest area of the mountains of the city. It serves the area of Quintero only with a uh, 43,000 gallon per day plant. Um, if we move over to the right of the screen on the Herman Keith water treatment plant. Currently, we're at 11 million gallons a day at this plant, or 23% ownership, and we are co-owners with the city of Glendale. There is an expansion process in the works. It's under design right now to take our ownership from 23% to 44.4 to the exact percent which will actually take our flow up to 24 million gallons a day, thus an increase of 13 million gallons a day. Our final plant is the Greenway Water Treatment Plant, and it is a 16 million gallon a day plant. This plant was built with the idea of an expansion in mind if needed. Um, after that, we move on to the um, wastewater plants. Joe Max on the left, upper left side of the screen serves the Estancia community. Currently, it is a 2.5 million gallon a day wastewater treatment facility. They're, they are in design now for an expansion use all the growth in the Estancia community. This plant serves the Estancia community only. We look like we have the Beersley wastewater treatment plant. This plant too is in design for an expansion as well. Currently it is at 4 million gallons a day. All of the water from Beersley Road and North flows to this facility for treatments. 
The final plan would be the Butler wastewater treatment plant. This is a 10 million gallon day plant. It's the end of the line plant for the city. Below Beersley Road, all the water below that goes to this wastewater treatment facility for treatment. All of these plants also have what we call reclaimed water. And Mr. Powers is going to talk about this in his portion of the presentation, but about 98 to 99% of all of our reclaimed water is either used for irrigation or ground recharge, which gives us recharge credits, which he'll talk about later. On to this, we move on to our well um, field. Currently, at this time, we have 30 active wells throughout the city. 10 of the 30 active wells serve the Viscontia community. Seven of the active wells serve customers south of Bell Road. The remaining 13 wells are located anywhere from Bell Road north as far as the 303 loop. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over. Thanks, Dave. The other part of our portfolio is our water portion of the portfolio. Dave is going to discuss our water portion and also discuss the effects of the drought on the Arizona Central Project. Arizona, Arizona Central Project. <laughs> Mayor and Council, thank you. Um, much of the presentation from this point forward is about water resources, where our water comes from, how we use it, and how we see the, the future evolving as far as our world goes. First thing I want to touch on is sort of a, almost a housekeeping item, and that's to, from this point forward, we're going to talk about water and a measurement of an acre foot. A lot of Dave, what Dave talked about was some gallons or millions of gallons a day or something like that. So I really want this to be relatable. Um, an acre foot of water is, a, is approximately a football field filled one foot deep with water. Uh, it equals about 325,000 gallons of water. Each uh, home in Peoria uses on average about 0.34 acre feet of water, 110,000 gallons. So the first thing I'd like to go over is what we produce. So in 2017, and the 2018 numbers aren't final yet, so we're doing 2017. It's a very comparable, probably off by a couple thousand gallons at the most, or a couple thousand acre feet at the most. Sorry. So in 2017, we produced right around 33,960,000 acre feet of water. Of that, we delivered 868 acre feet of reclaimed water to actual customers. So that's water that came out of our wastewater treatment plants, treated to a high level, and delivered to golf courses, the school, our parks, places like that. If you look at the chart on the slide on the right hand side, the blue there says Central Area Project Surface Water, and that comes down the Cap Canal to us from the Colorado River. And we used, treated that and delivered about 11,700 acre feet of water to customers. That comes to our Pyramid Peak treatment plant, water treatment plant. We also delivered about 10,000 acre feet of Salt River Project water through our Greenway water treatment plant. And then we recovered well water, say that three times fast, about 11,000 acre feet uh, in 2017. Um, the recovered well water is a, um, we, we don't want to call it groundwater, we want to make sure we call it recovered well water. And that's because in 2017 we recharged 10,000 acre feet of reclaimed water. In other words, we made a lot more reclaimed water than we delivered to our customers. So we put that into the ground like a savings bank to use for the future. We also put into the ground about 11,300 acre feet of Central Arizona project water. So if you add those two together, you get about 21,000 acre feet of water that we gathered up, put in the ground, and then of that, we pumped about 11,000 acre feet of this recovered well water out. The difference between those two is about 10,000 acre feet, and that's how we accumulate what we call long-term storage credits. We put more water into the ground than we take out, and the difference is the long-term storage credits. A lot of numbers and questions. All right. So what we want to talk about next is our leaking source of water that we can use for the Arizona Department of Water Resources. So we have what's called a 2010 Designation of Assured Water Supply. And basically, this is a mechanism the state uses to certify water sources that we're allowed to count to service our customers for existing uses and future growth. The water in order to count has to be legally, physically, and continuously available for 100 years. So the first uh, water resource we uh, talk about is the Central Arizona Project. Once again, CAP Canal. Colorado River is about 25,000 acre feet of water, 37% of our portfolio. 
Again, uh, we've seen the Salt River, Salt River Project water, and that's about 25,000 acre feet, 36% of our total. We also have reclaimed water. This is again from our wastewater, 5 to 7,000, about 900 acre feet of water a year. We actually make quite a bit more than this now. This is a designation from 2010, so we're actually between 11,000 and 12,000 acre feet a year now. And we'll, that'll continue to grow as we grow. We also have water from the Hay River Indian community and have 7,000 acre feet a year. We're allowed to pump 3,114 acre feet a year of groundwater, but we don't actually do any of this. And then towards growth, we're allowed to count 677 acre feet of long term storage credits. Again, we're in accumulation modes. We're not actually using this to supply customers, we're actually accumulating those right now. We have a goal of accumulating six years of long-term storage credits. Um, we're currently a little over five. That means we have about 100 and, uh, 160,000 acre feet of water that we put in the ground that the state allows us to count. So that helps us bridge times when we have water problems. We can use that water to pump it back out of the ground to get us from one drought to another or one shortage to another in emergency situation, things like that. Grand total, we have 69,117 acre feet. We add up all the sources above. Uh, we're told we're using around 33,959, so we're using right around 50% of the water that we currently have available. I want to make two quick points. One of them, not all these water sources are interchangeable. Uh, the Salt River Project water, for instance, can only be used to service areas that were historically serviced by the Salt River Project, um, and it's primarily a farming area, and it if you think about it geographically, it's primarily from Skunk Creek to the south and east. That's a good way of thinking about it. In other words, we can't take SRP water and pump it to the Stancy or something like that. It has to stay in this area. Other point I want to make, which is going to be very important for the ongoing conversation here, is that the Central Arizona Project water and the Gila River Indian Community water added up together are 32,000 acre feet of water. Both of those come from the Colorado River. Both of those come down the CAP canal, and they have equal priority. So legally, they're separate, but we oftentimes think of them as being the same water right because they have the same restrictions and the ability to move them around. They can be used anywhere we want when they're water, so they're very flexible. Any questions? Okay. All right, so I'm going to apologize right away for, the, for how complicated this might get. All right. So, uh, the drought has been ongoing for 18 to 24 years, so Christ the Christ Project, we can't agree on how many years we've been doing it, uh, but they'll agree we've been in a drought for quite a while. You've likely read or heard about the drought, currently affecting the Colorado River and possibly affecting water supplies to central Arizona. What I want to do for a little bit is start with a big picture, a quick view of what's happening regionally, and then we'll look at how that potentially could be affecting the majority of the region. The Colorado River uh, is divided up into two basins. You see on the right-hand side, we have the upper basin and the lower basin. And Arizona is part of the lower basin. We're uh, partners with California and Nevada. The Colorado River has two primary reservoirs out there. One of them is Lake Powell, which serves the upper basin, and it sits at about 42% full. Lake Mead serves primarily the lower basin, and it's about 39 in the early 2000s, people became concerned about how uh, quickly the lakes were dropping. And so they got together and decided they needed to do something about it. And they came up with what was called the 2007 Guidelines for Managing the River. And the short version of it is they decided that as the lakes dropped, people needed to take a cut somewhere and flow to keep the lakes from dropping further and further and further. You can't just keep taking the same amount and leave it dry. Okay? So over time, conditions in the river kept getting worse faster than people anticipated that it would happen. And so they came up with another plan. They decided that the 2007 guidelines wouldn't adequately protect the river, and they drafted up and proposed what we today call the Drought Continuous Plan, or the DCP. So the idea is that by taking even further cuts, than the 2007 guidelines called for, you could even more protect the river. Of course, it doesn't want to talk about the people that have to take cuts, but we'll get to that in a minute. One other point, the United States Bureau of Reclamation is the water master for the Colorado River. It is their job to protect that river and, and the people that it supplies as far as divvying up water rights and who gets what. Of course, there's a lot of history, there's lawsuits and all sorts of things that get us to where we are today. 
Any questions on that? So let's talk specifically about Arizona. Arizona water rights are junior to the rest of the rights along the lower basin. So our water rights are junior to California's and they're junior to Nevada's. Arizona has an allocation of 2.8 million acre feet of water a year. Of that, the Central Arizona project allocation is 1.6 million acre feet a year. The, the Central Arizona project's water is junior to the rest of the Arizona water in general. The point being, if Arizona is going to take cuts due to conditions on the Colorado River, those cuts will be taken in Central Arizona off of the Central Arizona project canal. And the way that will happen, or the way that will be managed, is shown here on the chart. Basically what happens is they, they look at the lake levels and they say if the lake falls to a point where it is below elevation 1075 and 1050, they'll declare something called a shortage tier one. The lake level is currently at 1081. So we're not very far, we're only six feet above this. Uh, and then you can see how the other tiers fall below there. As you can see, if we get below 1025, they'll declare a shortage tier three. The 2007 reduction guidelines call for cuts in the river as shown here. So how this works is if on January 1, the lake level is below 1075, above 1050, they declare a shortage tier one, and instead of 1.6 million acre feet of water flowing down the CAP canal, you get 1.3. So somebody that was using that 320,000 gallon acre feet of water has to figure out how to manage their world. And you can see the cuts correspondingly drop. The proposed drought contingency planning guidelines call for much deeper cuts, as I mentioned before. So in this case, when you have a shortage tier one declared, Instead of 1.6 million acre feet of water, you end up with 1.1 million acre feet of water to flow down the canal. And then, of course, if the levels drop down to a tier three, you end up with 720,000 acre feet less. So you would be at 0.9 million acre feet of water here, which is a significant cutback. The, much of the argument or conversation we play about DCP and the drought contingency planning process is the difference between these two plans. It's about who receives impacts going from the 2007 guidelines to the new DCP guidelines shown? And if you look at tier one and you go from 320,000 acre feet to 512, in that range in there, that's where <coughs> most of the agricultural folks lose their water due to how their water rights are set up. So if you hear about farmers in Pinal County being excited because they're going to lose some of their water, that's it. And it's very real. And if I was a farmer, I would be excited about that too. And you can see that the cuts just uh, carry on. And there's, there's a lot more detail in here that I've spared you. Um, there's actually multiple tiers inside of each one of these tiers. Um, and it, gets, it can get very confusing. I had to make a good charts to figure it out. Uh, for a long time, we've sort of viewed this as an abstract topic, the idea of cutbacks to the, you know, right? Okay, there's a drought. We can see the lakes dropping. It hasn't affected us yet. It's becoming very real and there's a sense of urgency. There's a better than 57% chance that we will be in a tier one in 2020. Okay. If at this point it's better than 57%, it will take a very wet spring for us to avoid a tier one being declared in 2020. The way that works is in August, they'll, they'll do projections and they'll declare we're gonna be in tier one at the beginning of 2020 and they'll let everybody know and we'll have some time to fight for it. Now where Peoria receives cutbacks and all this due to our water rights, is it's predicted we'll only have cutbacks only if we get to a shortage tier three. Okay? So the soonest they're talking about reaching a shortage tier three, and they're only giving it a 7% chance, is in 2022. However, that's very soon. And the striking part about 7% chance, that means there's a 93% chance to happen, right? But if you go back a year ago, that percent chance was zero. So we're getting back to what I talked about. The situation is getting worse faster than people expected it to. Any questions? Can you, so, would you clarify, you said you said the most <coughs> wet spring. Do you mean the wet spring here, or do you mean in Colorado? The most of Colorado, well, everywhere helps. But primarily in Colorado, I think 70 or 80 percent of the water that flows in the Colorado River comes from snow in Colorado and the upper basin states. So that's where 
where we really need it. If they have a well, it's easy to do that for us. Okay. So what does that all mean for us? What that means is Peoria has to plan for less water in the future. Even if, even if these percentages roll our way and we don't end up in one of these tiers, we still have to do planning. A basic framework has been developed for the for the drought contingency plan, which I saw that a little bit with the tiers. The next step is that the state legislature has to authorize the Arizona Department of Water Resources to sign the drought contingency plan agreement. California has to sign it as well. They haven't yet, but they're working on it. Nevada has, they either have it or it. And as I said earlier, most of the negotiations around adopting the drought contingency plan is mitigating for people who receive cuts between the earlier plan and the plan they're talking about now. And that's most of the discussion. The approximate cost of the plan, as of this morning, was $135 million. You go back a couple of weeks, it was about 100, yeah, a couple of weeks, it was $100 million. Um, $60 million is from Central Arizona Project Rates. The rates are paid by people like Peoria. We are a Central Arizona Project Rate payer. So what that means is they'll be asking Pay part of that $60 million through the rates we pay them to get their water. I'll touch on that a little bit more here in a minute. But primarily, that money goes to, to pay for higher priority water owners to give water to lower priority users to mitigate them for their use. All right, so to make it all even finer, the federal government has set a deadline for January 31st, 2019, for the state to adopt the Arizona Drought Contingency Plan. And that's at the fall, they start meeting next week. So, lots of sort of gloomy gloomy sounding stuff. Let's talk about some of the good stuff that's happening. A lot of work has been done to analyze possible future scenarios and plan for the future. We have actually implemented, uh, through your efforts um, and guidance, a lot of the analysis come out of this. So we have capital improvement projects that are underway to help us be more robust should we ever see a shortage. Things like a loop through through well and low mountain pipeline are all being built and will help kind of firm our supplies and make us more robust. From a regional perspective, we're active participants in the Arizona Municipal Water Uses Association. That's an association made up of basically the 10 largest cities in the valley here. Mm -hmm. Mayor Carla is actually the secretary treasurer of the Animal Board of Directors. We also have staff that attend technical meetings, planning meetings, budget meetings, uh, water resource meetings. We also involve Tom Atkins, of course, as mentioned earlier, in the intergovernmental relations process. He's currently meeting with elected officials or has elected officials. On a local uh, level, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we met in 2017 and adopted a drought management plan, state of the art plan. We also have assessed our own internal water uses, so we found ways to use less water or water treatment plants and places like that. We also have a modest level of education going on for uh, Peoria water customers. Um, we recently combined the sustainability and conservation groups with the idea that we could become more effective and efficient as we move forward. We continue to uh, work on capital improvement projects that will help us become more robust. And most important of all, we'll continue to come to you guys and advise you on sound water policy so that you can uh, make decisions, make informed decisions, not just through this process. There are potential financial impacts ahead of us. We talked a little bit about us being one of the people that use cap water, and so we pay them for it. It's possible cap water allocation costs will go up. There's, there's going to be a point where there's less water being used, and that water uh, uh, fixed costs are going to go up, the unit costs are going to go up, and so we're going to end up paying more for it, potentially, the cutbacks that are up. We currently pay about $6.6 .6 million a year in cap water costs. And as far as local rates go, we'll see how this goes. Um, if we end up receiving significant costs, we'll obviously have to pass some of those on. Uh, but we'll advise you as the situation develops. There is time, there's not this isn't a sudden decision that has to be made, but We'll see if short does arrive if we have to do this policy based on that. And we'll come to you for your guidance. Thank you, Dave. I know there's a lot of information to take in. So I'm going to summarize 
There were activities going on that, to adopt a plan that helped protect water levels in Lake Mead. And we're probably looking at 2020 with there'll be a reduction in water flow in CAP, which could eventually affect Peoria. And we are most likely looking at water cost increase. But last thing I'd like to say, but my most importantly, I think, is Peoria will continue to be prepared. We'll continue to have a balanced water for our public and the athletes in these conversations and keep you abreast of what is occurring. With that, as our presentation, I'd like to ask, answer any questions that you may have. Council, are there any questions? Um, I'm just, are, are you looking at me because you have a question? I have a question. Okay, go ahead. I called the Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a minute to think. Um, can you address for a second as a state how our conservation efforts um, have been successful? over many, many years now? Well, the numbers are uh, show that over the years, per citizen in Arizona and Central Valley, we continue to use less and less water. Um, there have been robust efforts over time to conserve. It's, you know, every city has lawn reduction programs, smart meter programs, you know, that kind of thing. An awful lot of this water does go on landscaping and irrigation. Um, and I don't have specific numbers for you. Uh, but there's no doubt that for citizen we're using lots of time. So I, I just want to say that because I think it's the first question people normally ask. Well, shouldn't we be using less water in the desert? And the fact is, yes, we should be using less water, and we are using less water, much less than we, than we used um, for decades. And so I think that that's a really positive thing to know, and I think it's positive for our citizens to also understand the diversity of our portfolio. And we've got, we've got um, a, an abundance of SRP water right under our feet where we are right now. And um, the CAP water, although it's a third of our allocation, it's going to get much more expensive. No matter what happens, it's going to get much more expensive. And I think that we just have to be open and honest about that bad news. Yes. Peter, if I could comment quickly too. Um, uh, the reduction in the use of water is predicated a lot of times on education and outreach. And just to reassure you, the WaterWise campaign from a regional perspective, from a value perspective, is still very active and will probably get kicked up a notch here. Um, we're currently actively partnering through our sustainability program with ASU to kind of look at the, at the outreach component and water conservation in general. And with respect to conservation and sustainability, um, the effort the initiative from a local perspective it is going to kick in here as well. So that will hopefully provide good information for those who use water, consume water in Peoria, whether it's an individual, an HOA, or business. Um, you know, we want to go out, we want to shake your hand, we want to listen, we want to offer up some, some ideas and suggestions. That's really going to be the first step um, prior to any, any austere um, actions that hopefully we'll never have to take. Thank you for adding that. <laughs> Any? I, I do. I yes, absolutely. So the, the public education, I think, is really important. Um, regardless of what plan we might be dealing with, I think that's just an ongoing, responsible way to live. And I really support that, especially with, with kids. Um, but, and, and every time I, I, I talk to staff about water or here, and we were just, um, Mr. Powers was just at a community meeting with me talking about this with some of my constituents who are very well versed and um, ask, you know, advanced questions, more advanced than my knowledge, definitely. But I really appreciate the presentation and how you broke it down um, and simplified this. And I always feel reassurance that we have done a fantastic job of managing this resource. What I kind of worry about is, and again, I hope we never come to this point, but um, and trying to understand how all this works. We're making good decisions, we're, we're storing this water. How do we protect that? Because when you get to a point where um, maybe someone else hasn't made as good a decision as we've made in Peoria, um, but yet we're kind of all in this together, how does that work? And I know that we hopefully don't have to worry about that today, but you know. Yeah. For sure. A lot of it's legally. I mean, we have a lot of our water rights. We're designated to legal legal process. 
but the water's in the, you know, all aquifer, and it's everywhere. So when you add stats and start to pull it out, it can affect the, 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 the aquifer. But we are going to be very involved in all of that. The nice thing is we're communicating with the animal city. All of us are in it together, right? And so I, I, and I think we all know that and we all want to work together. We're all in different positions, but the overall goal is that we all have a water conservation message, that we work together, that you know we all want to live in this valley, right? And be and be and thrive in a quality of life. And so I think we're gonna see is a lot of combined effort in all cities. We mentioned earlier uh, the legislative process. Uh, we have a, a really good uh, intergovernmental department, and I think to your point, um, the slide that showed the two folks with the shovels, they, that's what's going to go on. And uh, the assurance is we have a place at the table, and uh, we have a representation of the state legislature. That's where we need to be, and, and uh, you know, water policy experts at the table here and our IG efforts. We will monitor that every step of the, of the way, and as soon as we hear something or if there's a, a potential threat, um, um, we come right back to you through the city manager's office and go, here's the dynamic that's occurring. And Tammy's absolutely right. There is a, a, a legal process involved with it, but you know this essentially is about changing the of laws, and, and when you do that, you get a little uncomfortable on a lot of sides, and, and that's potentially the dynamic of where we're at. But we will monitor, we will watch, and we will protect your rights as we can. Yeah, I think that that is, is really valuable. Um, to repeat, you know, we, we've done a great job all of these years protecting the, the water portfolio for our residents, and for the long history of doing it, we will continue to do it throughout this entire process. Thank you guys for your presentation. It was very really beautiful. Very timely. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That, that is all that we have. As of course, as Mr. Strucker mentioned, we will continue to keep you updated. There will be subsequent discussions uh, to talk more about the Water Services Department, the portfolio, the impact on rates. Um, but rest assured, we'll be here. Sure, we'll have a lot of discussions at budget time. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are adjourned until our second game meeting. The Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Binsbacher. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The clerk will please call the roll. <coughs> Mayor Carlick. Here. Uh, Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Uh, Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Leone. Yeah. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. And Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Right. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of 
January 8th, 2019. Boy, time is going quickly, isn't it? The first item on our agenda this evening is the swearing in of newly elected officials by the Municipal Judge George Anagnost. And those elected officials are Mayor Kathy Carlett, Acacia District Council Member Vicki Hunt, Palo Verde District Council Member Michael Finn, and Pine District Council Member Carlo Leone. So I would like to begin with the judge joining me on the council floor or the city clerk. <laughs> We have our city clerk, Rhonda Jeraminski, that will help provide for the swearing in. I'll have to be a poor substitute for the judge here. I won't have to substitute for the judge. <laughs> Are you ready? Good. If I could ask you to raise your right hand and please repeat after me. I do solemnly swear, I do solemnly swear. that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the laws and Constitution of the State of Arizona. And I will faithfully perform the duties of the office of Mayor of the City of Peoria to the utmost of my ability. Upon my oath, I do so swear. Members of Council and Mr. Tyne, Ms. Hickman, members of the public, please give your applause and voice to your mayor. <laughs> Um, I just want to say a few things. Uh, first of all, I am honored and humbled to be the mayor of the city of Peoria. It is just a great privilege for me. And I was hoping that my family didn't so quickly sit down, but since they have, I just want you guys to know how thankful I am for all that you have done for standing beside me for the last 14 years as I chose this life of public service. <laughs> I know it has not always been the path of least resistance and certainly not always the easiest way to go, but you guys have been there supporting me the whole way. And if it wasn't for that, I certainly wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you. <laughs> and I, um, I want to express my, my most sincere gratitude to the citizens of the city of Peoria uh, for having your, your faith and trust and confidence in me to lead this great city one more time. So thank you very, very much. Uh, and I just have to say, it's, it's just an exciting time to be in the city of Peoria. Our stability has, has given us the opportunity to envision Peoria's finest future. And that is exciting. And, you, and we are now going to chart the course um, for our own unique progress 
and prosperity. And, and that's a wonderful thing to be able to, to say that we're going to do. And we're going to do it together. I would like to thank this amazing city council. They are committed and they are, um, they are working without an agenda other than what is best for the city of Peoria. So they are a great blessing to me. So thank you guys very much. And I would also like to um, thank our Peoria city staff so professional, so dedicated, so committed. Uh, and together, we will all build the future of the city of Peoria. Thank you. Mayor Carlett, with your deference, I'll ask the other three members of council who will step forward for the administering of the oath, please. Council Member Finn, Council Member Hunt, Council Member Leone. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. I will support. I will support the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States. Of the United States and the laws and Constitution. The laws and Constitution of the State of Arizona. Of the State of Arizona. I will faithfully perform. I will faithfully perform the duties of the office. The duties of the office of council member. Of council member for the City of Peoria. For the City of Peoria. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Upon my oath. Swear. I do so swear. Carlet, other members, department head, Mr. Tyne, and members of the public, put your hands together for your council. <laughs> Is a judge here? He is. <laughs> I don't notice him without his black uniform. But anyway, I just want to mention that this is my sixth term. Six terms on the city council. 
and six terms in the city council, the judge has sworn me in, and I'm still here. Thank you, judge. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, congratulations, everyone. And we will now take a short 15-minute break. The Peoria City Council meeting will now come back to order. And the clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Still here. Mayor Pro Tim Hunt. Here. Council Member Patana. Here. Council Member Binsbacher. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Leone. Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. And Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Thank you. And good evening again. Uh, we will now proceed uh, with the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted with one motion. Council, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? A motion. Second. A motion and a second. Council, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now move on to new business. And the first item on the agenda for new business, 12R, is the election of vice mayor. I'm going to read the rules of this um, election of vice mayor. Pursuant to Article 2, Section 8 of the Peoria City Charter, the City Council shall designate one of its members as vice mayor, who shall serve in such capacity at the pleasure of the council. The vice mayor shall perform duties of the mayor during his or her, her absence or disability. Vice mayors have previously been elected to serve either one or two year terms. At the January 9th, 2018 city council meeting, council member Michael Finn was elected as vice mayor to serve a one year term. An election for a new vice mayor and the establishment of the term length is necessary. So the procedure for the nomination and election of vice mayor is, city council will first establish the term length by a motion and a vote, Subsequently, the mayor will open the floor for nominations. The mayor will then state which council members have been nominated, and the council will vote by ballot, which will be verbally recorded by the city clerk. So we will begin then. Council, may I have a motion on a proposed term for the vice mayor? Mayor, I propose a one-year term for the vice mayor. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second for a one-year term. Are there any other motions? Seeing none, please vote. And that passes unanimously for a one-year term. And now I will open the floor for nominations for vice mayor. No second is required for this. Do I have a nomination for vice mayor? Mayor, I'd like to nominate Council Member uh, Binsbacher for vice mayor. Thank you. Second. Are there any other nominations? Since there is just one nomination, we will go ahead and vote just using our, um, our normal method of voting. So council, please vote. And that passes with one dissension. Carlo Leone has, dissent, has um, voted no on that. So Council Member Binsbacher is now Vice Mayor Binsbacher. All right, the next item is the election of Mayor Pro Tem. The mayor pro tem shall perform the duties of the mayor in the absence or disability of both the mayor and the vice mayor. At the January 9th, 2018 city council meeting, council member Vicki Hunt was elected as mayor pro tem to a one year term. An election for a new mayor pro tem and the establishment of the term length is necessary. And the procedure is going to be the exact same. So we will begin then with a motion on a proposed term for the mayor pro tem. Do I have a motion and a proposal? I move that we set a one-year term for Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Council, please vote. 
Oh, do I have a second for that? Second. With many seconds. <laughs> Council, please vote. And it passes with one dissension. All right, so we have a one year term for Mayor Pro Tem. I will now open the floor for nominations for Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to once again nominate uh, Council Member Vicki Hunt for Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Are there any? Look at that. All right, are there any further nominations? Seeing none, then Council, please vote on Ms. Vicki Hunt for Mayor Pro Tem. And that passes uh, with one dissension. Congratulations, Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. All right. We will move on now. We were actually going to uh, morph into the Vistancia Community Facilities District Board meeting. This is the consent agenda, which consists of the approval of the minutes of the May 15th, 2018 Vistancia Facility uh, commun <laughs> Vistancia <coughs> Community Facilities District Board meeting and the acceptance of the fiscal year 2018 annual financial report. Board members, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. And we will now move on to the Vistancia West Community Facilities District Board meeting. And this consent agenda consists of the approval of the minutes of the August 14th, 2018 meeting and the acceptance of the fiscal year 2018 annual financial report. Board members, are there any items to be removed from consent? Seeing none, do I have a motion? A motion and a second, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. If you wish to address the city council, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. And I have not received any speaker request forms. And so we will now move on to reports from city manager, Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you uh, about a few items. And the first off, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the hard work and long-term service that we've received from retiring uh, information technology director, John Imig. And I know John is in the audience John has led the city's information technology department for over 13 years. He has overseen immense change and progress in the organization's ability to streamline processes, preserve important data, and integrate systems with all of our operational and organizational needs. Uh, also very importantly, John has championed uh, the citywide cyber security initiatives, really leading to both an awareness and training efforts for all of our organization to really be prepared uh, for the, the current technology challenges that we have today. In recognition of John's years of dedication to the city and his professional leadership, I'm honored to also present him with a plaque as just a token of our appreciation for all of his work over the years. So if I may, I just present that and see if any comments for John. Mayor, members of the council, uh, city manager, thank you, staff, um, IT department staff. Uh, I am I'm humbled by this and so very appreciative at the opportunity that I've been given these last 13 years working for the city. I'm, I'm so very proud to have been part of Peoria uh, and to have worked with such a, an absolute terrific staff who, who has kept, you know, kept it running, kept it safe, kept it secure. I think one thing that, that I would like to take with me as my proudest accomplishment is that I, I would like to say, not on my watch. It didn't happen on my watch. 
And, and that for a, for a CIO and IT director is, is probably the greatest accomplishment in that uh, we all, all too often see it happen to, to larger cities, smaller cities, but um, it didn't happen here. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. And that's, that credit goes to our city staff who, who so diligently look out for our, our cybersecurity through the, the training and awareness that we provide and for our IT department staff who, who do such a terrific job and, and clearly the support of, of you, Mayor, and the council. So thank you. Thank you. I will miss you. Okay. Thank you. We will miss you too. So wonderful comments. Thank you, John. And um, just quickly, a, a quick update uh, with regard to what we call the livability initiative. So uh, as you are aware, the city council and staff had a great conversation and council really provided us some great direction of what would be the primary goals that we have for the upcoming years. And those goals really were items that we see that, that tied to the quality of life for our residents here in Peoria, which we call the livability initiatives. Over the next few weeks, uh, we have our city staff that is really organized in a concerted effort to really coordinate and see about how can we really make these goals and, and make them come to life. And in March, you'll have six of our leaders here in the city that will be presenting at a March workshop to you to really talk about what is the action plan to really make this all a reality, to really have Peoria stand out as, uh, as a level of distinction that you haven't seen before. So very excited, more to come on that piece. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the uh, events. Uh, before we get to upcoming city events, one important event that we had just on Sunday, really to help promote uh, water safety awareness, we had our annual Polar Plunge, which is an amazing event this year with 140 uh, brave souls and participants that braved the, the cold, chilly waters at Sunrise Mountain Pool. I wanted to recognize all the efforts that has raised at this point at least $3,000. That's enough to help provide uh, swim lessons for over 120 children um, and also includes uh, contributions from members of the council, including Council Member Patena as well. And wanted to just thank you. And just as a, a reflection of that, we have a, a short video to show you on that. <laughs> some folks in there and they had to quickly hit the showers, but um, it was really an exciting uh, event. Uh, with that, I'd like to just show a short video, a two-minute video that highlights the upcoming events, including an <coughs> event to honor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, as well as the installation and the dedication ceremony for Peoria's newest art piece, The Blooming Spire. To lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood, now is the time. Come alive, love's coming alive. Come alive, love's coming alive. Come alive. In what will go down in history.
that is all that we have. So I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're going to start with uh, reports from the City Council, beginning with Youth <coughs> Council Liaison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the council members and the mayor on their re-election. And uh, I'm very excited for what the Youth Advisory Board, the City Council, and Peoria can do in 2019. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so today I met with Audrina Rosales, a young Peoria resident who also serves proudly in her local uh, Girl Scout troop. Adrina is dedicated to not only educating our citizens on flag etiquette, but she also provides new flags to residents when theirs become torn or damaged. Adrina's inspirational return and replace project is the one she chose not only to assist her community, but also to help her earn one of the highest honors a Girl Scout can earn, the Bronze Award. What she's doing is a perfect example of how a young person can step up and change her corner of the world, one flag at a time. I'm very proud of her and for her commitment uh, to the Peoria community. On Thursday, January 3rd, I attended the retirement ceremony for IT uh, Director John Imig. Uh, John has been a staff member for 13 years, a director for 10, is that correct? Uh, he's managed the risk associated with the use of information technology and has protected the confidentiality and integrity of the city's software programs and John was also the director during uh, our Great Recession. Um, I remember when the credentials John came with 13 years ago when he came to the city and the city was happy to have him. The city is just now is sad to see him leave. Uh, he will, uh, John, you're going to be greatly missed, and, but good luck to you. On the same day, I was honored to attend the retirement celebration of two of our Peoria police officers. They are Officer James no Novoselic, he was an officer in Peoria for almost 20 years, and Officer Paul Hermans, officer in Peoria for 20 years as of uh, last August. And uh, this is dedication, 20 years of dedication to our city as first responders, and I uh, really appreciate their efforts. I'd like to congratulate the mayor, uh, Council Member Leone, Council Member Hunt, and Council Member Michael Finn. On their election. That, that hurt, didn't it? <laughs> <You did. laughs> on, on their election. Uh, it really is a privilege for me to work with these people up here. Um, our mayor is driven to make this one of the best cities. And like she said earlier, this is, uh, no one here has an agenda. We're all interested in nothing for us personally, but just to keep this city moving forward. And I think we've done that at least for the last four years that I'm aware of. So thank you. Um, you know, the polar plunge, I, uh, I went to the wrong pool. <laughs> but, and there was nobody there, but I, I wanted to take the opportunity to jump in anyway. So I did, but no one saw me. Um, so I participated, but that's all I have here. We all believe you. <laughs> Vice Mayor Vinspacher. Thank you, Mayor. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Um, congratulations, Mayor. Uh, we are, Peoria is blessed to have you leading our city, without a doubt. I want to congratulate all of the council members um, also that were reelected. I feel very fortunate to have kept this council together to continue to do the great work that we're doing. I'm um, especially honored and appreciative of the trust and opportunity uh, to now serve in the capacity of vice mayor. Um, it's always a privilege to serve this great city and represent the citizens of my district and all of the citizens in Peoria, and I'll be where I'm needed when I'm needed. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of the team. Uh, John Imig, congratulations to you on your future endeavors. I, I really do wish you well. Thank you for all the years of dedication that you put in to Peoria. Uh, little Adrena is amazing. Uh, I met with her today and visited with her, and she's doing some great work, and it's always so inspiring to see our youth taking charge and doing great things. Um, I'm sorry I missed the polar plunge. I have no story to tell. <laughs> um, but congratulations on all of you that went to the right pool and made that jump and raised that money for such a great cause. Thank you. I look forward to 2019 with all of you. Thank you. Councilmember Finn. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to let everyone know that uh, a while back, uh, Councilmember Patin and I were assigned to a um, kind of a task force, I guess, looking at, uh, at code and recommending some revisions. We've been working very hard on that. We had a final meeting um, yesterday, I believe, and we think we have some pretty good recommendations in there that we'll be bringing forward. So just wanted to give you kind of an update on where we're at on that, and I want to thank the staff, who was amazing at helping um, us walk through that. They were incredibly patient with me. <laughs> Um, and all of the sharpshooting I did on some of the language. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate their patience, and I think it's going to be a very good product that we, that we bring forward. So I just want to give you an update on that. John, congratulations on your uh, retirement. I hope you do everything that you want to do in retirement. I can't wait until I get there. Uh, congratulations to uh, Mayor and fellow council members on, on being uh, sworn back in today. I think that's fantastic. Um, great council. I think, Bill, you said it best. Nobody up here has an agenda. And we're all just looking out for the greater good of the city. And um, it sounds like we're doing a pretty good job if we all came back. So congratulations to everyone. I want to thank the council for the honor of serving as uh, vice mayor this past year. And congratulations to you, Councilmember Benzbacher, and to you, uh, Councilmember Hunt, on your reelection there. So um, I know you guys will do great things. And then um, unlike Bill's golf scores, I'm not going to come up with an excuse or some wild story that happened. I chose not to go to that polar plunge. And thank you for that video, because now I know exactly why I did not go to that. I'm happy to pledge I'm not getting in that water, though. Not happening. Look forward to a great year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to congratulate you and the other council members on your reelection. Uh, it's truly a privilege to serve with you and all, all of you uh, moving this great city forward. Uh, thank you so much. Just one thing, I just want to reach out and thank uh, Chief Miller and the officers. Uh, what a tremendous event uh, on the 8th. Your annual shop of the cop was a phenomenal uh, success. Uh, you, you helped 53, or you assisted 53 young individuals uh, shopping. And the event every year just seems to get bigger and bigger. And anything that I can do to help you in your future endeavors, please don't hesitate to reach out. But again, just want to thank you and your fellow officers. The smiles on those individual faces uh, was just priceless. And I just want to thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Gosh, I hardly know where to begin, but I'm, I'm going to be brief anyway. Uh, just thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for setting the course. Uh, it's not an easy job, and when I look at what you do, frankly, it makes me tired. <laughs> just think about what you do and what you accomplish. Uh, but you have really set the bar high for the rest of council, for staff, and I think for what our citizens expect. And uh, all the accolades that our city has won, a Money Magazine and all the others, I think really speaks to the fact that together, including our citizens, we're doing a good job. We're doing what our community expects. Um, and I'm, I want to thank my council members for having the confidence to ask me to be Mayor Pro Tem again. I, I like that. And I'm, as I think John said, I'm, I'm here to serve. So whatever I can do. I, I want to just shout out to staff again. This really is a fun job. If, if, if everybody knew how much fun it was, they would all want to do it. Because we work, every time I have a meeting with someone on staff, it's just fun. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not something that I don't look forward to, like when I used to have to go to the principal's office uh, when I was a teacher. Um, no, it's fun, and it's a fun job, and mixing with our uh, constituents and our neighbors, that, that's part of it, too. I do have a number of HOA meetings set up for the coming year, and if you're listening and you have an HOA that you would like for me to visit. Um, and my husband is the only one of the family still here. The others left to go eat Mexican food. But he stuck with me, as he always does, and I literally could not do this job without him. He, he stays home, he takes care of the dog, um, does all kinds of things at home. And um, so, honey, I love you and I appreciate you. Now there's one thing, and I, I know you probably can't see this from there, but I want to invite everyone, there is an Arizona, really well-known Arizona author coming here to Peoria. She is the guest of the Peoria Women's Club. She'll be here Saturday morning 
at 1030 down at Worship and Word venue, that great big church down on Grand Avenue. Um, it's, it's 8175 West Grand Avenue. And she writes about, and she's an award-winning author, she's amazing. She writes about pioneer women in Arizona and the contribution that women made to our progress. And, and she also has one book that's about teen, teen girls and the contribution that they made. So I, this is kind of short notice, but I know nobody has anything to do on Saturday morning, right? Uh, so try to come out. It's going to be really, really good. And it'll be only about an hour of your time. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Leone. OK. Um, Youth Council Liaison Gilbertson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd just like to congratulate you and other council members we elected and say Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you, and Happy New Year to you, too, and Happy New Year to everyone who is watching this show right now. 2019 is going to be a great year. I just want to thank Council Member Finn for his great job at being the Vice Mayor last year. Thank you for all of your assistance, and I look forward to working with the new Vice Mayor this year, and um, the same, Mayor Pro Tem, thank you for your service last year, and more of the same for this year. Uh, and one more time, I just want to express my gratitude to the citizens of Peoria for, for putting their trust in me to lead our city for one more year, one more term. <laughs> it's four years, <laughs> one term. <laughs> and with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>